So in chapter 20, so we've just read, if everyone is valuable, then no one should be invisible. So we're carrying on this theme of contempt into chapter 20. So what happens when we have such disregard for people, when we have contempt for people, that we ignore them completely? What's the consequence or what happens because of that? So when we're angry, have you ever been angry? Angry enough to really want to hurt someone? Why, if I got them in a back room, boy, I'd... I can see, boy, I can see the people have active imaginations. <laughs> okay, come, come back to me. <laughs> That's anger. We can all relate with that. We're angry. We want to hurt someone. But contempt is not caring whether they are hurt or not. Because it doesn't matter. We just don't care about them anymore. But, as Dallas Willis in his book Divine Conspiracy explains, um, he explains why contempt is... Um, worse than just ordinary anger. He says, In anger, I want to hurt you. In contempt, I don't care whether you're hurt or not, or at least I say so. You're not worthy of consideration one way or the other. We can be angry at someone without denying their worth. But contempt makes it easier for us to hurt them or see them further degraded. So let's take this to the most extreme example we can think of in modern history, Germany during World War II. When the Nazis came to power, they actually convinced people that Jew, Jews or Jewish people were subhuman. Not that they acted subhuman, but they were actually not human. So once contempt, and that's a contemptual thing, that I'm feeling superior over this other race. So once contempt took hold um, and Jews were seen as less than human, any behavior towards them became acceptable, even mass murder or genocide. How can we just, it just blows my mind. How does this happen? And some of you might say, well, if I was there at that time, I would never allow that to happen. But seemingly good people God-fearing people committed horrifying acts of atrocity because they viewed their victims as not human. And how did it start? It started with contempt. So this plays out even today. One being camp cancel culture. People are ostracized by culture for the things they may have done or said. And it takes a kind of a form of retribution against them that seeks to prevent that person from ever speaking again about anything. And in some cases, deliberately seeks to destroy that person, their career, their way to make money, their, um, even an attempt sometimes to write them out of history that they never even existed. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. People need to experience the consequences of their actions. And others need to be able to seek justice without shame. Those are things we've already discussed. But as followers of Jesus, we must not allow contempt and indifference to prevent us from considering every person to be made in the image of God and therefore redeemable. I was reminded of a story in the book Everybody Always by Bob Goff. And I don't know if you've read this book or know who Bob Goff is, but he's a, a lawyer who's a follower of Jesus. And he was invited by the Ugandan government to come and become sort of the legal consul of Uganda, I think was his title. And he was given that position so that he could help um, correct some of the problems in, within the country because there was such corruption people were getting away with things, including child trafficking. And so Bob Goff, in one instance, uh, there was a child that was attacked and mutilated, and he did not die. And this became a, a chance for um, Bob to prosecute a witch doctor that had performed this act against this young boy, because now they had a living w witness. And so the, it went to trial, 
And um, even though there was still a lot of corruption in the country, the, the main justice or judge actually was um, attacked by several witch doctors to the point where he had to surround his house with armed guards. But in the end, justice did prevail and this man went to jail for life. And they put him on death row. So he was supposed to be executed eventually. Now again, in this country, it took, like ours sometimes, it takes many years for this to actually happen. And there's lots of processes you can go through to appeal and all that kind of stuff. And Bob was quite overjoyed that this victory had taken place and that this boy saw justice happen. He was able to face his accuser face to face, tell the story that happened to him, and see him be punished for what had happened to him. And Bob was actually able to bring him back to America and have, um, he was able to have surgery to correct um, some of the mutilations that were done to him. So you think this is, this is a great story, isn't it? It's a story of justice. It's a story of things that happened and we're glad to see them happen. But then Bob tells this amazing story about how he was challenged in his spirit the Holy Spirit challenged him to love his enemy. And his enemy in this case is this witch doctor named, if I'm pronouncing it right, Kabi, K-A-B-I, in prison. And at first he says, no way, this guy's getting what he deserves. And I'm, I don't know much about Ugandan prisons, but Bob says they're pretty bad places. So, um, he had that nagging feeling that it wouldn't go away, and he went to visit this guy. And he said he didn't want to, and it was very difficult for him to face this man. I mean, think of the other side, too. This guy had gotten away with an awful lot of stuff. He finally gets what's coming to him. He's in prison. And now the guy who put him there wants to see him. So you can imagine how that may not have, he may not really have wanted to see Bob either. But he did. He came to, to see Bob. I guess at that point when you're in that kind of prison, you're willing to see anybody just to see somebody. And they started to talk. And they talked about their families, about what was important to them, and they shared stories. And then Bob asked what he can do for the man. <laughs> Still like, trying to get my head around that. And the man says, I need forgiveness. And Bob in the book says he's kind of flabbergasted at this point. Forgiveness? You don't deserve, it's in his mind, you don't deserve forgiveness. And yet he's reminded of who? The thief on the cross. And so he tells him about Jesus. And the man decides to become a follower of Jesus. And we were talking, Jay was talking about hope before. This is a very hopeless situation. And the man does. And Bob goes back to visit him several more times. And they lead other inmates to Jesus. Now I don't know it doesn't say whatever happened to this man, whether he's still in prison or whether he died or whether he was finally executed. But the man himself said he came, he said he admitted he deserved to be there for what he did. And he was willing to go through with whatever punishment was appropriate, but he found hope in Jesus and forgiveness. The end of that statement, Jesus said, unless we are willing to do this for people, then we ourselves are not suitable for the kingdom of heaven. No one is unworthy of God's attention or grace. Absolutely no one, no matter what they have done or said. So who in your life have you written off or canceled? I ask myself the same question. I have to ask God to help me 
changed my heart towards those people. I think sometimes for us it means just doing the smallest act, choosing to speak to them instead of ignoring them, showing kindness or maybe even generosity. It's scary to even think about it. But maybe that's what Jesus requires of us.